Hi, welcome to this screencast on cell transport variations. Before we get into all the details, let's take a look at this picture. So what we can see here is the cell membrane in red and yellow, and that's kind of keeping the boundary between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell in the cytoplasm. What we have in blue is a particular channel that can go in, that can let things like sodium out of the cell. It can let things like potassium into the cell. And so this is an actual channel, we call it a pump, that is in almost all of your cells and it helps you to move. Uh, so it's a really important um, feature of cell membranes to let stuff in and out of the cell to allow for movement. So that's just one example of how we're going to look at the cell membrane and what it does. Now let's recap first. Um, all of our cells, whether we're an animal or a plant or a bacterium, need to get certain things into the cell and need to release things out of the cell. Those things include food, um, oxygen, water getting in, getting out, the waste that those cells produce, such as CO2, maybe some additional water, and even products that those cells produce need to be released so that other cells can use them. And so the goal of the cell membrane is to regulate what goes out and what goes in. Now, if you take a look at this particular diagram, um, we'll, we can kind of see the structure of the cell membrane. We see the little, um, these little heads with these two little tails. That's the cell membrane. And embedded within the cell membrane are all of these different colored channels. Now what's super great about the cell membrane is that it can regulate what goes in. And so that's called semi-permeable. It has a little bit of control over what can enter and leave the cell. It's not completely permeable. Not everything can go in and out. Just a few things can go in and out. So it can pick and choose. And now how do things move in and out? Most of them move in and out through specific channels. There's a specific channel for food. There are specific channels for water to enter the cell. And there are specific channels for waste to leave the cell. Okay, so semi-permeable just means the cell membrane controls what goes in and out and how they move in and out, usually through specific channels. And a few things can just squeeze straight through if they're small enough. So what we're going to look at now is take a look at that cell membrane and how it regulates what goes in and out through passive transport, through active transport, and then my favorite, through bulk transport. So let's take a recap of the one transport you're probably most familiar with, and that's osmosis, which is the movement of water. So if you take a look at these sugar molecules, I could count them one, two, three, four, five, or we could just look down here, and then there are three on the other side of the cell membrane. We're going to add some descriptors to this. If there are more sugar molecules on one side, we refer to that as hypertonic. On the other side of the cell, if there's fewer, hypo, less concentrated. And you'll notice that there's actually fewer um, water molecules on the hypertonic side if you would count them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to move some molecules. We're going to move water. And I'll show you why we're doing that. But water always flows where there's more sugar molecules or more concentrated particles. So water's going to move from the right of your screen to the left. We get rid of this. And if we keep watching, we're going to see those numbers go down. The sugars stay the same. They're too big to cross through these little openings in the cell membrane here. But water's small enough to fit. So it's going to go, keep going from right to left. And you'll notice that those totals start to change. That the one on the, the right gets less concentrated. The percentage of sugar to water goes down every time, or goes up, excuse me, and the one on the left goes down because it's becoming more dilute. And we can keep going. We're almost there. And now we have reached a monumental point. We have the same concentration on both sides. Water has diluted the hypertonic side and um, got the less concentrated side to boost its concentration. And so we've reached something called isotonic concentrations. Both sides are the same. And so water moved to create an equilibrium. And that's why it moved across to make both sides the same concentration. Water moved from 
the hypo to the hypertonic environment. Now let me give you some different terms to put this in perspective. So this is the same drawing that you just saw, the same animation, but we started with more water on this side. And water moved, remember, downhill to where there was less water. And that was the whole pulp. That's osmosis, where you're taking more water and moving it to where there's less. It helps to reach equilibrium. Because if you think about it in, in nature, particles in water, they don't want to be all crowded. They want to have space. So they're going to move where they're really crowded to where there's more space for them to roam around. And so that's what we just saw. Now, a very similar type of scenario happens. We don't call it osmosis anymore. We're going to call it diffusion. But let's label some things on the diagram. We have a cell membrane right in the middle. Notice these little pores. And they're big enough so these little particles can fit through. And we have more particles on one side and less particles on the other. Now, just like osmosis, we're going to move things from where they're really crowded to where they're not. And so we're going to go downhill. This is easy, just like going down a slide where there's a lot to where there's a little. And so we can move those particles from this case from left to right. So we started with three on one side. We went to four. We're now at five. This is particle six. This is seven. And this is eight. Now, if you count on the other side, now there's eight on the other side. They're equal. And so the bottom line is, in this case, the particles moved to create equal concentrations. They have reached equilibrium. So the particles moved from where there was a lot more particles to where there was less particles. And why did they cross? To reach the same concentrations, to reach equilibrium. So to sum things up, we looked at passive transport, um, and there's two examples, diffusion and osmosis. So let's write on that big flow chart now. Passive transport is moving things from high concentration down to low. It's really easy. Now the difference being diffusion uh, requires movement of particles like oxygen and carbon dioxide. Osmosis, on the other hand, is the movement of water from high to low across that cell membrane. What we're going to do is compare passive transport to the opposite, active transport. And to do this, we're going to look at ion pumps. So here's our drawing again. We can label one thing in the middle, our cell membrane. I'm going to abbreviate that CM. And then on one side, we can label that there are more particles. On the other, there are less particles. So we have more concentration on the left, less concentration on the right. Now this time, if we look at these big, big particles, they can't fit through this cell membrane here. That's not going to happen. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to have these channels, these openings, these passageways for these larger particles. And indeed, they can fit. But now, we're going to do the opposite. If this was diffusion, now if you think for a moment, if this was diffusion, these particles would be going from left to right. They'd be going down their concentration gradient. But we're pumping this time. We're going the opposite way. We're going from where there's not very many particles uphill to where there's a lot of particles. And this is hard work. This is swimming upstream. So take a look at the animation. We're going to move these particles from, from the right of your screen to your left. And they're going to have to fit through a channel. And we pumped them across. But however, this is my lightning bolt. This is my lightning bolt of energy. It takes a lot of work for your cell membrane to do that. It doesn't want to do it, but if it has to do it in certain situations, it's going to. It's going to use some energy to do that. We're going to go from, from low, uphill, to high. And so they get pumped against the concentration flow. So to summarize, here is our active transport. And now let's define it. Active transport is moving things from low concentration, uphill, to high concentration. And I'm going to put a little E here, the exclamation point, because that requires energy. And on the other side, I'm going to put 
I'm writing a little small here. I'm going to put the word channel pump. That's this purple thing right here. It requires a specific channel to pump those guys, those little particles, through from, from low uphill to high. And it requires a bolt of energy to do that. And that's an ion pump. An example of active transport. So, so far we've looked at passive transport going from high down to low. No energy required because we're just floating downstream. Active transport going from low to high with the use of energy and pumps to do that, channel pumps. Now, my favorite is bulk transport, which we're looking at transporting big big, big quantities of stuff, either into or out of the cell. And there are two examples we're going to look at, endocytosis and exocytosis. So for the final time, here is our cell membrane. Notice these particles are so large that they can't fit through here. And in fact, they're so big that we don't even have channels that are big enough for them to fit through. So we have some big particles outside the cell, some big particles inside the cell. Now take a look at what's going to happen for bulk transport. We're going to take this cell membrane. It's going to start to start to make a little envelope, a little engulfing, if you will, all the way around this these big big particles. And it's going to kind of you use your imagination. It's going to just swallow up these particles, and it's going to move them into the cell. Just like that. It's going to form, it's going to engulf those things and spit them into the inside of the cell. That is called endocytosis, moving big, big quantities into the cell. Now, on the other hand, we can have the opposite happen. So these particles can get closer and closer to the cell membrane. They can fuse with the cell membrane and then they can go through to the opposite side. And that's the opposite called exo cytosis, exiting the cell. Let's look at what this looks like in detail, in actual cells here. Exocytosis, so this is releasing or um, exiting, disposing of cell, either of waste from the cell or products the cell produces. So you can see the cell membrane, or these little particles get closer and closer, and then they fuse with the cell membrane and release the contents out. Endocytosis, on the other hand, is very similar to a cell eating large, large quantities. So we can see the cell membrane is just engulfing these particles into a little vesicle, and then they can fuse or, or, or release the contents anywhere it's needed in the cell. Okay, so endo and exo, big, big molecules being transported. So here's our final flowchart to recap. We had active transport. One example was an ion pump using channels to pump from low to high. Passive transport, simply moving molecules from high downstream to low. No energy required, and this comes in the form of diffusion and osmosis. And finally, bulk transport with big, big quantities moving into, so let's see, let's write endocytosis, let's define that one. Big things being absorbed into the cell. Exocytosis, releasing big things, either waste or products the cell has produced. That's a look at all the different variations of cell transport, and I hope that you found that helpful.